Chapter 2 of Plunkett of Tammany Hall A series of very plain talks on very practical politics. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Vendetti Plunkett of Tammany Hall A series of very plain talks on very practical politics by George Washington Plunkett Chapter 2 How to Become a Statesman There's thousands of young men in this city who will go to the polls for the first time next November. Among them will be many who have watched the careers of successful men in politics and who are longing to make names and fortunes for themselves at the same game. It is to these youths that I want to give advice. First, let me say that I am in a position to give what the courts call expert testimony on the subject. I don't think you can easily find a better example than I am of his success in politics. After 40 years experience at the game, I am, well, I'm George Washington Plunkett. Everybody knows what figure I cut in the greatest organization on earth. And if you hear people say that I've laid away a million or so since I was a butcher's boy in Washington Market, don't come to me for an indignant denial. I'm pretty comfortable. Thank you. Now, having qualified as an expert, as lawyers say, I am going to give advice free to the young men who are going to cast their first votes and who are looking forward to political glory and lots of cash. Some young men think they can learn how to be successful in politics from books, and they cram their heads with all sorts of college rot. They couldn't make a bigger mistake. Now understand me, I ain't saying nothing against colleges. I guess they'll have to exist as long as there's bookworms. And I suppose they do some good in a certain way. But they don't count in politics. In fact, a young man who has gone through the college course is handicapped at the outset. He may succeed in politics, but the chances are 100 to 1 against him. Another mistake. Some young men think that the best way to prepare for the political game is to practice speaking and become an orator. That's all wrong. We've got some orators in Tammany Hall, but they're chiefly ornamental. You never heard of Charlie Murphy delivering a speech, did you? Or Richard Crocker, or John Kelly, or any other man who has been a real power in the organization. Look at the 36 district leaders of Tammany Hall today. How many of them travel on their tongues? Maybe one or two. And they don't count when business is doing at Tammany Hall. The men who rule have practiced keeping their tongues still, not exercising them. So you want to drop the orator idea unless you mean to go into politics just to perform the skyrocket act. Now I've told you what not to do. I guess I can explain best what to do to succeed in politics by telling you what I did. After going through the apprenticeship of the business while I was a boy by working around the district headquarters and hustling about the polls on election day, I set out when I cast my first vote to win fame and money in New York City politics. Did I offer my services to the district leader as a stump speaker? Not much. The woods are always full of speakers. Did I get up a hook on municipal government and show it to the leader? I wasn't such a fool. What I did was get some marketable goods before going to the leaders. What do I mean by marketable goods? Let me tell you. I had a cousin, a young man who didn't take any particular interest in politics. I went to him and said, Tommy, I'm going to be a politician and I want to get a following. Can I count on you? He said, sure, George. That's how I started in business. I got a market real commodity, one vote. Then I went to the district leader and told him I could command two votes on election day. Tommy's in my own. He smiled on me and told me to go ahead. If I had offered him a speech or a book full of learning, he would have said, ah, uh, forget it. That was beginning business in a small way, wasn't it? But that is the only way to become a real lasting statesman. 
I soon branched out. Two young men in the flat next to mine were school friends. I went to them, just as I went to Tommy, and they agreed to stand by me. Then I had a following of three voters, and I began to get a bit chesty. Whenever I dropped into district headquarters, everybody shook hands with me, and the leader one day honored me by lighting a match for my cigar. And so it went on like a snowball, rolling downhill. I worked the flat house that I lived in from the basement to the top floor, and I got about a dozen young men to follow me. Then I tackled the next house, and so on down the block, and around the corner. Before long, I had 60 men back of me, and formed the George Washington Plunkett Association. What did the district leader say when I called at headquarters? I didn't have to call at headquarters. He came after me and said, George, what do you want? If you don't see what you want, ask for it. Wouldn't you like to have a job or two in the department for your friends? I said, I'll think it over. I haven't yet decided what the George Washington Plunkett Association will do in the next campaign. You ought to have seen how I was courted and petted then by the leaders of the rival organizations. I had marketable goods and there was bids for them from all sides. And I was a rising man in politics. As time went on and my association grew, I thought I would like to go to the assembly. I just had to hint at what I wanted. And three different organizations offered me the nomination. Afterwards, I went to the board of aldermen, then to the state senate, then became leader of the district and so on up until I became a statesman. That is the way and the only way to make a lasting success in politics. If you are going to cast your first vote next November and want to go into politics, do as I did. Get a following. If it's only one man, and then go to the district leader and say, I want to join the organization. I've got one man who will follow me through thick and thin. The leader won't laugh at your one man following. He'll shake your hand warmly, offer to propose you for membership in his club, take you down to the corner for a drink and ask you to call again. But go to him and say, I took first prize in college at Aristotle. I can recite all Shakespeare forwards and backwards. There ain't nothing in science that ain't as familiar to me as block signs on the elevated roads and I'm the real thing in the way of silver-tongued orators. What will he answer? He'll probably say, I guess you were not to blame for your misfortune, but we have no use for you here. End of chapter two. If this video useful to you, so please like, subscribe and share this video to your friends. If you have any questions in mind please ask it in comment box.